I have a few more announcements uh, that didn't make it to Jamal in time. Um, a high school friend of Sherry's, Cindy, who lives in Colorado, was recently diagnosed with cancer. Uh, please pray for her. She undergoes aggressive uh, treatment. Uh, we had a Facebook request from our service this morning from Danette, who says, uh, asked for prayers. She has pneumonia, but not COVID. Uh, and as, as Eric had mentioned, Chuck left this morning, he had a, another episode. Uh, so uh, Tammy was taking him to the hospital to get checked out. Hopefully everything's okay with that. And uh, John and Susan Marks both have COVID. So uh, remember these individuals in your prayers, add them to your prayers. Um, if I am up here and I start to lean a little bit this morning, I apparently have uh, vertigo. I've had it for a week. I've never had it before and it's not fun. So if I start leaning this way a little bit, I'll, I'll grab and hold steady myself. So uh, this morning, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, I had mentioned previously last week that uh, Sherry and I had gone down to Tennessee to a seminar uh, by Dr. Gary Chapman on the five, five, five love languages. How many of you have ever heard of this before? All right. How many have taken the quiz to know what yours is? Okay. Um, it was very good. We went with uh, my, uh, Jerry Nath and uh, spent the weekend with them. So. Uh, I brought back a bunch of stuff basically for hopefully future uh, teaching material for a marriage class because he has a lot of good things to say, uh, Bible-based, taken from scriptures. Um, but So I thought I'd talk a little bit today about the five love languages. Um, as you see here behind me, he wrote the book titled uh, Five Love Languages. You can Google it. Um, there are, he has since there written a lot of books uh, regarding marriage and family and all types of things. Um, and in this book, he describes how people and individuals uh, are individuals and they communicate and respond to communication in different ways. Um, and we, so we need to attempt to discover the language our spouses speak in order to effectively, effectively communicate with them. Of course, we speak all of these languages, all five of them, but if you take the quiz it will, and answer the questions, it will come back and tell you which is most dominant and, and then order them based on how you answered the questions. Um, and why this is important is because we know, we think we know what ours would be before taking the test possibly as I go through these. Uh, but it's important to know what your spouse's love language is so you can effectively interact and communicate. Very rarely is it that the spouses have the same languages, the same dominant language. Let's look at the word love, first of all. Love by human definition, oops, I forgot to use my little, oops, now too far, there we go. Love by human definition from Merriam Webster says strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. Affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests. Unselfish loyalty and benevolent concern for the good of another. That third one gets a little closer to what the biblical uh, definition of is, but if we look to see what God's definition, obviously many times we go to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll start with verse 4, and this is the ESV. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never, fail, love never ends or fails, depending on what version you're using. And if you jump to verse 13, it says, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Ephesians 5, verse 25, it says, uh, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is the type of love we are to have for our wives. 
in the English Standard Version, the word love, the four versions of love, uh, are listed 684 times in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament. 684. That's how important this is. The first love language, as described by Dr. Chapman, is words of affirmation. Mark Twain once said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. Uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. What are words of affirmation? They're compliments, encouraging words, kind words, humble words. Try to track the words you speak to your spouse in a day or in a week. How many of them are words of affirmation? How many of them are critical words? Keep in mind the love tank. So what he described was that you have this love tank or bank that some people would describe it as, and things, words of affirmation and acts of kindness and all these things, all these things fill this up. Fill it up with love. How's that? Okay. Am I there? Yes. Okay. I can't. See, when I turn around, then I start to spin. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so it fills up this love tank or bank. Uh, and critical words or things that negative things that happen between spouses. It doesn't, and these things don't have to be just between husband and wife. They can be family members. They could be siblings. They can be, it, it teaches you how to interact knowing what language that they have, uh, how you interact with them. But things that are neg negative and critical drain that tank. So how full is your love tank on a daily basis? Keep track of how you speak to your spouse, how you speak to your children, children, how you speak to your siblings. Uh, keep track of that and see how many are positive and how many are negative in a day or in a week. Um, so if your tank is full, you're, you're full of energy and raring to go. Uh, if it's empty, you're, you're drained, you can't go anywhere, just like an empty gas tank. I'm sure all of us have had one of those at one time or another. Did it turn? Oh, okay. Well, it's getting there. What? Yeah. Spinny, spinny, spinny. Write a love letter or send a special card to your spouse. Don't be surprised if you find it tucked away in a box or a drawer many years later when people have gone to move or things like that. You know, how many of you keep these things, special cards or moments uh, tucked away in a drawer? I have a drawer uh, full of cards that I have gotten. Um, in practice, uh, here's an example It says, uh, this actually happened the other day. Uh, husband texted his wife while she was at work. All it said was, thinking of you. And the response was, you're speaking my language. Because that was her love language, words of affirmation. Make it a challenge to say these words of affirmation in the presence of others. Friends, in the presence of friends, church members, co-workers, and especially in front of your children. These, this makes these words all the more powerful and meaningful. Not only does this build up the recipient of these words, but it also provides motivation for them to live up to those words. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, we read, Love builds up, or edifies. It doesn't tear down. The second one is quality time. Am I on quality time? Yes. All right. It's a little crazy on the screen. Um, the, language is, the second love language is quality time. Uh, and that some people speak that, and this is expressed in several ways. Focused attention, okay? It's not enough just to be in the same room with someone or in the same vicinity with someone. It's focused attention on that person. Do things together as well as give full attention when doing individual things. Quality conversation. Conversation is more than just facts or summary of the days. Men tend to talk about facts and events. Women, for the most part, tend to talk about feelings and things like that nature. Conversation that involves thoughts, feelings, interest, and without interruption. Here's an experiment, guys. Go out to eat, 
Talk about the day with your wife. Don't just listen. Ask questions. Look her in the eye when she talks. Keep your phone in your pocket and never move when that ESPN jingle goes off and the score hits your phone. Uh, keep that thing in your pocket. Keep her as your focus and your whole attention. And I'm pretty sure that she's going to say it's one of the best dates that you've had in a long time because your attention was focused on her. Here's tips for quality conversation. Maintain eye contact. Don't listen and do something else at the same time. How many of you are annoyed when you're trying to talk to your spouse or your children and they're on their phone, right? Happens a lot. And I'm guilty of that. Listen for feelings. This is one especially for the guys because we tend to focus on events and things uh, rather than feelings or inflection in, vo in, in their spouse's voice. Observe body language and refuse to interrupt. I have a bad habit of interrupting during conversations and my excuse is because if I don't say it right then, I'm not going to remember it by the end of the conversation. So I have to, that's, that's not a valid excuse, but that's what I use. Quality time. Uh, learn to talk. Okay, not just speak to each other, but to talk. Get, uh, Dr. Chapman stated that 50% of wives indicate that they have uncommunicating husbands. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here uh, and see if we get 50%, but uh, that seems to be the norm. And uh, husbands and wives that are divorced, the wives, 86% of them uh, said it was because their husband was not able to communicate effectively. As I mentioned, men often speak of, spac of facts and events. Women speak more freely of how events made them feel or make them feel. Though we are different, different, we must first make an effort to understand each other. And that's why we do these love languages. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, Peter writes, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessels, since they are heirs with you, uh, <coughs> heirs of you, heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. If we all take and no give, we become like the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. So here's an example here below. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is full of life, full of fish, full of, of plants and things like that. It's, it's vibrant, it's growing because the Jordan River feeds it and it also flows out. So it's constantly full and being renewed However, the Dead Sea is not that way. The Jordan River flows out and doesn't, the Dead Sea doesn't release anything. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea. There's so, there's so much salt content. No fish, no life, no plant life, nothing like that can live. So an example here, don't be like the Dead Sea. Be like the Sea of Galilee. Always let things come in and flow back out and communicate. And it, it keeps everything alive and vibrant. You can do quality activities. Do things together that your spouse uh, likes to do, whether you like doing it or not. Examples, go shopping at Target. Not my favorite thing to do, but I do it. Uh, watch Hallmark movies, men, or sports, ladies. Go hunting with your spouse. I just threw that in there as a joke because that, that will never happen. But in some cases, <laughs> In some cases within our congregation, that, is, that does happen. So uh, um, do things together and sometimes do things that you don't like to do. Like as Jamel had mentioned in the announcements about the singing next week, maybe it's not your thing. Uh, but, but do it because the church is doing it and you know how much joy it brings. My mother's already said how, uh, how she's looking forward to it uh, next week. So that is quality time. The third one is receiving gifts. Am I there? I don't want to have to turn around anymore. The third uh, love language is receiving gifts. Gifts are visual symbols of love. Acts 20, verse 35, we read, and Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than receive. And we know that in our own lives, especially being Christians, how, how good it makes you feel to give something, not necessarily that you have to get anything back. Um, this language is understood more clearly by some than others. Some speak this language while others know only a few words of it. 
some, sell, some seldom want things. In fact, uh, some, when gifts are received, they're actually taken back. It's not their language. So this is why you have to know, know your spouse or your family, your siblings. Uh, and also people that don't have, this is not high on their love language, receiving gifts. Uh, not only do they take things back, but they usually are not big on things like flowers and cards and things like that. Uh, however, some, some know what the others like. So uh, books, clothes, electronics, tickets to events, trips. That's D. Wilt's number one thing, trips. She'll, she'll go anywhere. The greatest gift you can give is the gift of self. Example, he says, I've seen the failure to do this at, uh, all the time at some events. Uh, man, when the thing is over, uh, it could be a fellowship, it could be a wedding, it could be a funeral. It could be something, uh, a get-together, some other get-together. Uh, typically, men like to shoot out of the place uh, when the event is over, thinking they've fulfilled their obligation. Uh, they bail on their wives and head off to pursue their own agenda and leave the wives to talk or uh, do whatever they need to do. And not all gifts have to cost something. For example, the gift of presence, just like I said, the gift of self. Okay. The fourth love language is acts of service. Am I there? Yeah. All right. Getting the hang of it. People tend to criticize their spouse most loudly in the area where they themselves have the deepest emotional need. 1 John 3, 17 and 18, John writes, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This love language requires us to re-examine our stereotypical view of husbands, husband and wife's roles. You've all heard the thing, actions speak louder than words. I wrote these things down for myself, basically, uh, on the husband's side, help with, uh, for acts of service, help with the housework, help with the kids if they're small enough, help with their homework, help with bedtime, uh, help with the cooking, uh, help with errands or shopping things like that, things that I don't typically uh, help out with. Uh, actually, since the, we went to this seminar, I have taken it upon myself to do the dishes a few extra times, so uh, um, I'm learning. So, um, but there's lots of things that we can do as acts of service. Uh, and also one thing that he mentioned here that noted, teach children to do things for themselves. Uh, in these types of acts of service, whatever, don't do everything for your children because then a lot of them grow up and they can't do anything for themselves. They can't function. That was number four, acts of service. The last one, the last love language is physical touch. Physical touch is a way of communicating love. Holding, hugging, holding hands, kissing, sexual intimacy are all ways of communicating love. Don't make the mistake of believing that the touch that brings pleasure, brings pleasure to you will also bring pleasure to your spouse. So if you like to hold hands, maybe your spouse doesn't. If, you, if your spouse likes a hug or an arm around her, maybe you don't. Maybe you feel uncomfortable. So don't just assume that you like the same things when it comes to physical touch. Physical touch is also instinctive when it comes in times of crises. When you're scared or saddened, we pull each other close. We hold each other tight to console each other. If your spouse's primary love language is physical touch, nothing is more important than holding her as she cries. This is speaking from my point of view here. Okay? So that, those are the five love languages as described by Dr. Chapman. So, oops, let me get back. So, Sherry and I took the test, uh, the quiz, basically. You can do this. You can find it online. And she said beforehand, and all during the thing, mine is going to be physical touch. Number one, physical touch. So we took the quizzes, and this is the results, surprisingly. My number one was quality time, followed by words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of kindness, and then receiving gifts was the last. Sherry's was words of affirmation, then quality time. So our top five were pretty close, except the top two were flipped. So mine that she thought, was pretty sure was going to be physical touch, was actually third on the list in priority based on the questions that I answered. 
So it's surprising. So here's some homework. If you haven't taken the quiz or had taken the quiz and haven't taken it in a while, take it again. You can find it here if you just Google five love languages quizzes. You can find it online. It takes a couple minutes per, per person. Um, some other things. Ask your spouse about their childhood. Memories. Listen and engage as they talk. There's tons of stories in our, in our childhood. We probably never even told our spouse. A lot of them come out around the Thanksgiving table and things like that when we get together. But engage and actually talk and listen. Ask your spouse what activities they would like to do. Plan them and do them. Plan a date to talk. Have a review, his, review our history night. Write down some questions and discuss them. We actually have a thing we call it a memory jar, and we got this actually from Mike and Jerry uh, when we were with them many years ago. So when we have events that are important to us, uh, it could be anything. It could be we went to a movie together, we took a drive or whatever, and we have a ticket or a program or something, we put it in this jar, in this memory jar, so that down the road, years down the road, or any time at a point, we can sit down and pull these things out and say, I remember that. I remember that. And these are all good memories, you know. Um, half of ours actually, it doesn't have to be good memories. Half of our jar is full of hospital bracelets. But uh, just, <laughs> that's our family, and you know how that goes. Um, make a list of all the requests your spouse has made of you. Things, these things are important to him and her. Decide to see it as a tag or a nag. Whatever they're tagging is of value to them. If you have more money than time, hire someone to do special acts of service for your spouse. Hire someone to clean the house or do whatever if you, don't, if you physically don't have that time uh, that you can make. Hold hands and hug each other. Give shoulder massages or relieves tensions and stress. And any of you who, who like those types of massages, you know how it can melt the stress away. And let other people see you doing these things. All right. Now, in conclusion, I'm going to read a couple more verses, and it's talking basically about love and how, how the Bible views it. In these, th and this is a Colossians 3, starting with verse 7. In these you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also must forgive. So you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Proverbs 3 says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So to sum this all up, check out your love languages with your spouses, your siblings, or whoever it is, and find out what theirs are so that you can effectively communicate and work on those together. Um, we know what the Bible is about, and God is about love. So these scriptures that we read here, especially as Christians, we have a greater burden to be Christ-like, to love our neighbors and even our enemies, and forgive. And so that translates not just to those in the outside world, your coworkers, it especially starts at home. It starts with how you treat and talk to your spouse. It starts with how you treat and talk to your children. And as your children see this in your lives, then they will grow up to be the same loving way and kind and humble and compassionate. So now we come to the conclusion, if anybody has any need today, it doesn't have to be about this. It doesn't have to be the, about... The, the love languages in your life or how you treat your spouse or children or coworkers or friends or whatever. If you're struggling with anything in your life, we offer an invitation. 
uh, each and every time that you can come forward and we will uh, pray for you. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, we can do that as well. Um, if you have any need at all, come now as we stand and sing.